Breaking news. Canon Rumors has leaked new specs for the Canon R5 Mark II, which is going to launch in just a few days on July 17th. So you get to see all about the new camera right here first. I'll tell you all about it, but first I want to thank our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace.com slash Tony is the place to start when you have any new idea, a personal project, a business, a photography portfolio, a video reel, whatever you can think of deserves its own place on the web. Squarespace.com slash Tony is where you can go to try it out completely free. Put your ideas together, make it look beautiful. And when you decide to sign up, use the coupon code Tony and you can get 10% off. So thanks for sponsoring us and making this possible. These come from CanonRumors.com who does a lot of work, so they deserve some credit. Be sure to follow their blog. The specs we already knew pretty closely resemble those of the current Canon R5. It's a 45 megapixel full frame camera. It does 12 frames per second with the mechanical shutter, which means very limited rolling shutter. And then with some rolling shutter, you can go up to 30 frames per second with the electronic shutter. The maximum video capabilities are upgraded from 8K at 30 frames per second to 8K at 60 frames per second, though there is a little asterisk saying that that's going to be limited in some way. I suspect it will probably be raw which is what the Nikon Z8 and Z9 do, which means the files are going to be absolutely huge and they might fill up a card really quickly. It's definitely a challenge, but it is nice to have that option for when you need it. And the Canon RAW files are really easy to edit. Onto the new stuff. The R5 Mark II is supposed to have the eye-controlled autofocus from the Canon R3, which I found to be useless. <laughs> we tested the R3 thoroughly and uh, it, it would work, but I had to set it up every single time I used the camera. If I picked it up the next day, it wouldn't work reliably and ultimately that was too much trouble for me. And also selecting autofocus points isn't really a challenge with modern mirrorless cameras. They pretty much find the eye or the right part of the picture to focus on. So uh, I don't think that's a benefit and if I were Canon, I, I wouldn't bother unless they've made some significant improvements to it. They have also improved the viewfinder in that now when you're shooting continuously, there won't be a blackout. That was kind of a big step that we took in 2018 or so when Sony launched the original A9. You can now shoot sports and you kind of just see it unfolding in your eye like you're watching a video. They are going to be improving the pixel shift technology. Pixel shift takes that 45 megapixel sensor and produces something huge by moving the sensor a fraction of a pixel in each of the directions and then stacking the images together. Canon released pixel shift as a feature for the original R5 through a free firmware update. That was pretty generous of them. And when we tested it out, we found it was on par with the pixel shift technologies from Sony and Nikon and Olympus, which is to say it's not useful in the real world. My hope is that Canon is going to continue to make this more and more useful. I, I actually like Canon's pixel shift implementation better than the competitors. So if they improve upon it and can find a way to make it more and more useful for things like landscapes where the extra resolution would actually be useful, I'd be really excited, especially if it's done in camera with no external app. That might be something that would make me want to switch to Canon. They're also going to offer some illuminated buttons. And I, as a person who does astrophotography, but also concert photography, anytime you're working in dark places, you'd be surprised how often you need to access a button where your fingers don't necessarily remember exactly where it is. Now, this isn't a problem the 10th time you go out and do night photography, because by then you've kind of memorized where all the buttons are, so you don't need to look at it. But the first time you go out and you do some work in low light, I, I always end up pulling out my smartphone flashlight and trying to use it to find the buttons that I need. So illuminated buttons definitely make that easier. Like my Z9 has that and I absolutely love it. So I'm excited to see that brought to the Canon R5. All the cameras should definitely have that. Canon Rumors is saying they're going to focus down to negative eight EV, which is basically saying it's gonna focus in really dark conditions. This EV measurement that you always see is essentially meaningless because it's also factoring in the speed of the lens. So the EV would depend on the lens you put on it and they probably have their like 85 F12 lens attached to get to this. So if you're using a slower lens, it's gonna be a higher EV. And also in my own testing, a lot of cameras claim to autofocus in really low light, but then I actually go and use it and it doesn't work very well or requires like uh, a focus illumination light to come on. Canon Rumors is saying they've improved the battery life in some way, but it's gonna be marginal. Like I, I think it's probably going to continue to use the same battery, but maybe they've made some software improvements to manage the battery life a little bit better. They're increasing the speed of the electronic shutter to be something north of one eight thousandth of a second. 
but nowadays it seems like every camera has a shutter speed of something like 1 16 thousandths or 1 32 thousandths and honestly never ever use that so I don't particularly care about that. Here's what I think is the most interesting spec. Canon Rumors is saying that the camera is going to have 16 stops of dynamic range. Even Canon Rumors kind of doubts that. If you don't already know, dynamic range is the difference between the very brightest parts of the picture that still have detail and the very darkest parts of the picture that still have detail. Dynamic range is measured in stops, which is very confusing because a stop is a having or a doubling, so it's like an exponential thing. The R5 has 11.85 stops of dynamic ranges measured by photons to photos. So if the Canon R5 Mark II had 16 stops of dynamic range, well that's four additional stops of dynamic range and each stop is a doubling or having. So 2, 4, 8, 16. 16 times more dynamic range. And the way dynamic range works on a sensor is each individual pixel has what they call the well capacity. It can only store so much light and then it's overflowing. It works just like water pouring into a bucket. So if you had a really big bucket, you could store a whole bunch of water and then you'd be able to measure a difference between a small amount of water and a big amount of water. Well, each individual pixel does that. But here's the thing, dynamic range and well capacity has leveled out for like eight or 10 years now. Like sensor technology has not advanced in dynamic range at all. So one of two things could be happening here. Canon could have developed a brand new sensor technology which increased the dynamic range capacity 16 fold <laughs> which would give us an ISO, a base ISO of about ISO 6 and that would be incredible. That would mean you'd have essentially no noise at the base ISO. Your landscape images would be sharper and cleaner. It would also mean you wouldn't need to pull out a ND filter for long exposures nearly as often, only if you need to go to extreme long exposures. Now, if Canon had increased the dynamic range by half a stop, I think, okay, yeah, they're probably doing that through a sensor technology improvement, but increasing it by four stops, that seems like too big of a leap, but there are a couple of ways that they could accomplish this. The most likely for me is just with software. You could simply capture consecutive images with the electronic shutter, like in rapid succession, and then average them together. That is exactly what all modern smartphones have been doing for many years now. For five or six years, computational photography has allowed smartphones to have essentially functionally really low base ISOs, really good dynamic range, and really low noise, far better than their sensor sizes would allow. And conventional camera manufacturers, well, at least the big three, Canon, Nikon, Sony, have never really worked this into the camera. So I'm guessing that Canon is finally doing some computational photography and that would be great news. Essentially Canon already does this with pixel shift that we just talked about where it captures sequential images and adds them up. So you could actually do that to extend the dynamic range and the base ISO without necessarily also increasing the resolution. I can't wait to test that out. Subscribe to our channel and as soon as we get our hands on a production copy, we will get you a full review. It has a full-sized HDMI port because the mini and micro HDMI tend to come loose. It has some passive cooling, which should help it record for longer periods of time. That's gonna be really important with those high resolutions. And they're gonna be offering an accessory grip that will add some active cooling to it. So basically a hand grip or something that will help keep the processor cool so that again, you'll be able to record for longer periods of time in better quality. Can you remember saying that it's gonna have some new autofocus firsts? Maybe it's doing underwater focusing on fish now. Like they, they keep adding new subjects that they can recognize. It's also gonna be new sensor stabilization modes which should help us hand hold in low light conditions a little bit better when there's a still subject. Nikon with the Z6 III will change the sensor stabilization based on the autofocus point. So if you're using an off-center autofocus point, you should be able to get more stabilization than you would otherwise. The price is rumored to be about $4,000, which seems right to me because that's a little bit above what the Nikon Z8 is and it's well below competitors like the Sony Alpha 1. I think that's a good and fair price. It will be announced on July 17th and will ship in August 2024. I'm gonna compare it to the Sony Alpha 1, the original Canon R5 and the Nikon Z8, and then I'm gonna complain about some things that it's missing because it's never too early to start complaining.
So how does it compare to the original Canon R5? Well, the R5 now is selling new for $3,000 or used for about $2,500. So it's going to be significantly more expensive. My hunch, Canon will keep selling the R5 because the R5 feels like a modern camera. Like it's been a few years, but nothing really has developed that much. And the R5 is still a good camera. The megapixels are the same. The mechanical frames per second when you can't have rolling shutter, they'll be the same. But the maximum frames per second with the electronic shutter will go from 20 to 30 frames per second. And the maximum video rate will go from 8K at 30 frames per second to 8K at 60 frames per second. So if you wanted to do some 8K slow motion, you could. I use that a lot with my Nikon Z9 for wildlife video, where you both need to crop and slow down frequently, and I find it really useful. Additionally, the R5 Mark II should have better dynamic range and autofocus, eye-controlled autofocus point selection, and lights on the buttons. Comparing it to the mighty Nikon Z8, which is the best value out there right now. Well, the Nikon Z8 is selling for 3,500 new or 3,200 used. So the R5 Mark II is going to be more expensive. But Canon always charges more. And Nikon is sort of underpricing their bodies to get people into the system. So that makes sense. The megapixel count should be about the same. The Z8 can do 20 frames per second raw with its electronic shutter. There is no mechanical shutter. Um, and it does 30 frames per second, but only JPEG. Sports guys, mostly okay with JPEGs, but us wildlife shooters often need the extended dynamic range of the RAW file, so that's going to make the R5 Mark II really a better choice. They'll both be able to shoot at 8K 60 frames per second. I suspect they'll both be RAW, Nikon RAW and Canon RAW, respectively. They both have some button lights, and perhaps the R5 Mark II will have better dynamic range and eye-controlled autofocus point selection. Finally, comparing the R5 Mark II to the Sony Alpha 1. The Sony Alpha 1 is Sony's flagship camera and it's priced accordingly. Like new, it's still $6,500, even so many years after the launch, but they're selling used for about $4,600. So that's within spit and distance of each other. They essentially have the same megapixels. They essentially both do 30 frames per second raw with the electronic shutter, but the R5 beats it in every other way. Like the A1 does 8K at only 30 frames per second, but the R5 Mark II should do it at 60 frames per second. And then the R5 Mark II adds some new modern features. So this is kind of scary for Sony because they really need a new flagship. They can't have Canon's mid-range camera surpassing their flagship camera. I suspect Sony has an A1 Mark II coming out pretty soon that will probably beat the R5 Mark II, probably with just higher frames per second and such. But I'm excited to see Canon stepping up the battle because if you can get A1 capabilities at $4,000 new, that's going to be a pretty amazing value from Canon. I find myself frustrated with every new camera release because I'm saying the same stuff every time. It's got more frames per second. The readout speed is faster. The autofocus is smarter but those aren't the things most of you need. That's great for sports and wildlife photographers, which I am one of. So I appreciate those things. But so many of you are casual photographers. You're vloggers, you're YouTubers, you're doing family pictures, you're doing weddings and portraits and events, and those things aren't game-changing for you. There's a lot of features that they seem to have been neglecting for the longest time, like fast internal memory that didn't require us to have a memory card and would allow us to use the camera. Even if we forgot a memory card at home, that would really be helpful with a memory card as a backup. But instead of two slots, give me internal memory in one slot. Let's improve the usability because I, I'm sure this has happened to everybody. You remember that there's a feature you need to change in your camera, but then you have to spend several minutes digging through the menu systems. There's no camera with searchable menus and the menu Organization is absolutely awful. I struggle with it, and I've been using these terrible user interfaces for about 30 years now. Somebody new to pick up the camera who grew up in the smartphone generation where everything is straightforward and easy, they find it unbearable and they just go back to using their smartphone. I also wish there was some more accommodations for vertical shooting. Vertical shooting is still always an afterthought. People hold their cameras like this, but now most social media, stills and video, is shot vertically. And even with the vertical grip, the menus don't rotate. The viewfinder, I always find it a little bit weird to use vertically. I wish somebody would make a camera that was vertical first and horizontal second, so at least we had the option. There's still also no Canon Nikon Sony camera that has wireless audio built in. Like These are hybrid cameras for video. But if you want to get sound like from a lavalier mic, like what I'm using here in my lapel, you end up having to attach an external receiver. But little cameras like the DJI Pocket 3 prove that they can build that receiver in and make something that's reliable and more efficient 
None of the big manufacturers have done this. I also wish we could have some kind of security. Many photographers pride themselves on going in places that aren't that safe. Anti-theft would improve the safety of all of us photographers, but it would also make us a little more inclined to spend a little bit more money and to use our cameras a little more frequently since we wouldn't have to worry so much about them getting stolen. But also we take personal, private, confidential pictures often, so they should be encrypted. There should be authentication on there. And current cameras have none of those features. I'd also love to see functional Wi-Fi. I just tested the Nikon Z6 Mark III and it is 21 times slower at transmitting files than my iPhone is. Not half the speed, 21 times slower. And the Canon cameras actually are a little slower than that. <laughs> the performance we get out of these is so unbearable that I never end up using the apps or even recommending them, but I still have to do everything by moving memory cards or plugging cables in. Let's get decent wireless performance and preferably and also the option for cellular connectivity that does not have to be expensive. So you could instantly back up your files on location, even when you don't have Wi-Fi, which you know might help you in case somebody steals your camera on your way home from a trip. While we're at it, give me some GPS. In the comments down below, tell me what you want out of the Canon R5 Mark II and if you'd buy it at $4,000. And don't forget to check out our sponsor Squarespace anytime you need a new web presence. Social media is dying. It's unreliable. It's being taken over by AI. Get your own private domain name. Set up a store, take appointments from clients. Whatever you can imagine is easy and beautiful to set up at squarespace.com slash Tony. I have three or four websites of my own right now. Chelsea has a couple. We love them and we've loved them for a decade now. <laughs> After your free trial, no credit card required, the coupon code Tony will save you 10%. Thank you, Squarespace. Bye.